comes to developers and creative types, there's only one thing they love more than letting people see their finished product, lying about it. When they hold all the information or people are simply uninformed, spreading a little misinformation can be a way to poke fun at everybody taking their work so seriously. It's still fun to post lies on the internet, right? Well, even long before the internet was used and abused like it is, people found ways to spread a few tall tales. Whether it was by print or word of mouth, hoaxes spread, and today we're looking at some of gaming's greatest hoaxes. Times people were taken for a ride and had their heads messed with. And what better way to mess with somebody's head than, aha, boobies! Lara Croft is one of the most famous femme fatales in video fames. Developed by Core Interactives and released in 1996, Tomb Raider is a franchise that spawned almost 20 games, pulled off the impossible of having a gritty realistic reboot and it working, and launching a film franchise with... Uh, results? And to think that's all because of a pair of boobies you'd cut yourself on if you touched them. Yes, critics of the time praised the game to have it in back for its gameplay, saying it was as close to a Mario 64 killer as the PlayStation had. But if we're being honest, the words Tomb Raider were not the first two things that a lot of guys in the 90s looked at. Yeah, they knew what ladies were, and they weren't even afraid to put them on the cover of the game. It didn't matter that Laura was a tough-as-nails adventurer who re-extincted the dinosaurs. People just wanted the goods, and they were going to go to any lengths to get them. Thus, the nude code was born. Through some complicated button inputs like X, circle, circle, X, L, R, L, R, unplug the controller, plug in an N64, one twirl the stick, get a life start, you were gonna get to see the goods! Imagine that, I'm sure they're saving all the detail for under that shirt, it's gonna be so worth it, I love polygonal women! This got back to the developers and they were pretty annoyed people were calling them perverts for putting a naked lady in a game that kids could play when no naked lady was present. In reality, there never was a nude code. There was gonna be a nude code, but the developers Toby Gard and Paul Douglas said, What the f***? No, go away. And they made the classic blunder, letting fans have anything. Soon sites began popping up all over the internet that hosted a nude patch for Tomb Raider's PC release, promising titillation in 32 bits or less. Then, because the internet is a dark and sweaty place, soon the results for the nude patch would come up before anything else when searching up Tomb Raider. Toby and Paul eventually got sick and tired of seeing people thirsting over their creation and decided to bite back in Tomb Raider 2, finding the most commonly used code associated with the nude code and making it cause Laura to- bit of a harsh punishment, but it was her fault for having boobs in the first place. And it was Toby's fault for making it that way. As in the first interview he did for Tomb Raider, he said that the reason Laura was packing, and I'm using the scientific term here, please don't be mad, <clears throat> um, hubba hubba jubbly bubblies was because he was messing around with the size and accidentally made it 150% as big instead of 50. Oh, Toby, you Fucking idiot! Come to find out years later that after this was circulated as a hard fact, and I do mean a hard fact, that the quote and indeed the entire interview was just an elaborate and dryly delivered joke. Wait, how could such obvious sarcasm be taken as fact? Wait, where's Toby from? Okay, never mind, makes sense. Speaking of the British people, Rockstar North could probably butt its way into conversation for the most successful developer of all time. I mean, even if you throw out every other outstanding success they've ever had, forget Red Dead Redemption 2, Max Payne 3, GTA 5, Lemmings, you still have Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, the highest selling game on the best selling console of all time. 17 million copies for the 155 million PS2 sold. That's one in every nine PlayStation owners having run over a prostitute with their car. The crime spree simulator influenced so many people, warranting fan engagement the likes of which most games would kill for. And when you love a game, you want to know everything about it. But we already found the sex minigame, so we're really running low on content. Why not make up our own? GTA, ever since its inception, and especially in the 3D era, has strived to create as realistic a world as it could. You have to run on a treadmill in the video game GTA San Andreas that you bought for $60 when your character gets too fat from the food that you have to eat in the game so that he doesn't starve to death so you don't run slowly, okay? We're willing to sacrifice fun for realism. Try us! You'll have to take bathroom breaks in GTA 6! So maybe that goes far to include a legend of the Los Angeles area. Who doesn't love Bigfoot? The documentary Harry and the Hendersons has shown us he's a chill dude, so I don't see why we can't get him in GTA. The forests of Baco Beyonds are vibrant and rich with... Nothing. What would be the point of having this massive wide open forest area if not to hide a secret there? Well, 
aside from a few cars and a weapon or two, there really isn't much worth exploring here, is what I would say if I was a smooth-brained Bigfoot truther like you, sheeple. Don't you see this is all a conspiracy by Big Oil and Bigfoot to cover up the existence of Sasquatch in them their hills? Why else would the park be shaped like a foot, kind of? Oh, there's Bigfoot here. I can smell it. This place is lousy with skunk apes, and I'm gonna bag me one. Okay, so they're good at camo, whatever. Yeah, try as people might, it looks like Bigfoot would just be as hard to find here as he was in real life. Except I'm actually the god of this world. I own the video game, so I get to do whatever I want with it. And I want to go into the source files and check for any abominable snowman. You can't hide forever! So he's really good at hiding. There is not a speck of Bigfoot in this game anywhere, and the devs came out and said as much. Filthy Bigfoot sympathizers hiding him right under our nose. Well, if he's not in the game, how do you explain this photo? Oh, it's a... it's a mod of the... game. Well, this one is sure to... Nope, uh... Uh, just another mod. Well, when you see this one, you'll son of a... Bitch, how many of these are there? This actually does tie back to our grotty little sex minigame. When San Andreas was recalled to remove the minigame, people were convinced that the Bigfoot secret had been added to make up for it. Rumors had always existed, but when the devs had the chance to switch up the game with the re-release, people were certain, this time we get to go Sasquatch hunting! When searches came up cold, why not get a little internet fame and cook up a quick slapdash mod to add a little yeti to the game? Now people could fool their friends with a fraudulent cryptid. While all this was happening, however, Rockstar was sort of sitting back wondering, what are these freaks going on about? But if the Megalodon shark card is anything to go on, they have no problem messing with their player base. Six years later, in the expansion for Red Dead Redemption, Undead Nightmare comes out. Obviously, in a mode centered around a zombie apocalypse in the Old West, it's gonna get a little funky. But I doubt many people expected the urban legend to come to an end in this expansion. When traveling in the wilderness, you find an old coot who says that he just put a bullet in a Sasquatch and tasks you with finishing the job and taking out the rest. When you catch up to one, you... Yeah, whatever, that's just a guy in a costume. After committing actual for realsies genocide, you square up to the last Squatch and find out, oh no, they can talk. And they have families? Well, had families. And we get the final choice to either finish him off or let him go. The last of my kind. We've lived in these hills a thousand years. You eat babies. This is all quite dignified, but why not the opposite of that? Fast forward even further to GTA 5. You have to complete the game 100% before you get the mission The Last One, which is a parody of the Red Dead mission. You meet up with a suspiciously familiar hunter who wants you to help him hunt down Bigfoot. When you do catch up to him, he gives you the same speech as before and... Wait, does Bigfoot have a zipper on his back? Ask. Oh, I knew it! I knew it! The mission was put here as the last one in the game, since anyone willing to comb through this entire map for all the dumb garbage they want you to pick up is worthy of getting closure from a hoax from nearly a decade ago! This is for hardcore GTA fans. Pokemon is a series with no shortage of people making up stupid stuff to get clicks. You can kill the Pokemon, new evolutions, megas, and regional forms. They're calling half the Pokedex. All right, guys, try harder next time. Being the most profitable franchise, Ever. People are always going to try to be cashing in on a Pokemon and their player base of five-year-olds. The first one ever to gain a lot of momentum is revolving around Mew, the first Pokemon. First, po first, first Pokemon. Po See, there wasn't a real way to get Mew outside of complete flukes and events, which... Do you remember telling your mom that you needed to go to Toys R Us? Oh, do you want to buy a new toy? No. So when people heard there was a way to find him in the game as it is, well they were more inclined to listen than usual. Thus, players searched far and wide for where the pesky little weasel was hiding, eventually aiming directly at this out-of-place, unreachable truck near the SSN. Okay, so this must have been the right place, but A, how do we get to it? B, what do we do then? And C, will Mew be my friend? Well, to answer the first question, you have to glitch around to get Surf in Fuchsia City before entering the SSN, since as soon as you get what you need off the captain, it will leave forever and you can't access it anymore. But you do need cut off the SSN captain to progress further, so just figure it out. All right, step two. Now that we're here, we gotta use cut on the tires of the car and then use strength to push the car away. Why would you cut a truck's tires before trying to push it? Whatever. Then you'll finally get to fight Mew! 
I guess he doesn't want to be my friend. Yeah, there's not only no Mew, but no point to the truck itself. It's just a truck, and you slashed its tires. Nice job, jerk! Game Freak was aware and subsequently made fun of this in all available opportunities. But not only did they make the truck reachable in both Gen 3 remakes of Red and Blue and Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, which also gave you an item for getting there, but they also gave a character in XD Gale of Darkness a line to make fun of the player, letting them know there were no Pokemon under the truck. So it was just a simple mistake. But I know the truth. You've heard of red pills. It's time for the red shills. This video is sponsored by me, Finding Mew 3. Yes, this is the first hoax I have first-hand experience with. See, when I was living in a trailer after my house burned down, we had some kids over who had a Game Shark version of Pokemon Emerald. They took us to the island you get Deoxys at, but instead of him showing up, we found Mew 3! Holy shit, there's stuff after two! The allure of Mew 3 was insatiable. The idea of having this nice round group of three, making him look even cooler, giving him five mood slots, tucking me into bed, he can do anything! There was never really one solid rumor as to Mew 3's existence, just sort of a cavalcade of different one-offs that never really garnered enough attention to say for certain who was right and who was wrong, and how to find him. The closest we ever got was with a fan hack Pokemon Chaos Black, which made him look like this. I don't like this! By the time of Gen 6, the Mewtwo would finally figure out addition, and we had Mews 3 and 4 in the form of his Mega Evolutions. If you count Shadow Mewtwo X from Pokemon Tournament, that's like Mew 5! However, there's no Pokemon Purple Edition. There is Pokemon Yellow, though. And you know Pikachu couldn't escape the rumor mill. It all starts with the trans icon Meryl. You see, when this squirt was first revealed, it was incorrectly called Pigablue, since... What would you call this thing? It looked like Pikachu a bit, and that's enough, really. It looked like every generation would get a Pikachu. Well... But there's no Pokémon called Pikablue! Right? Well, idiot, look at this! Yeah, original Pokemon the movie trading cards from the Pikachu's Vacation short, and who would happen to be front and center? Pikablue! Only for the first printing until Matsuda slapped them in the back of the head and said, Peekaboo, that's the best you could do? Come on! Nowadays, most Pokemon rumors are just leaked scans from the Koro Koro magazine to show off new Pokemon. In Gen 5, there was a reveal of the three starter silhouette, and. And some people just had real fun with it, really made a day out of getting it this wrong. Oh boy, I am excited to talk about this one. The only ever time I've managed to talk about one of my favorite games was in Thou Who Shall Not Be Named. And now I can finally talk about Shadow of the Colossus, one of gaming's greatest pieces of art. Shadow of the Colossus manages to tell an epic story while telling no story at all. You draw your own conclusions, venture through harsh terrains, all accompanied by the sounds of silence. The gameplay isn't for everyone, but I think it's a blast, and so did many others, to the point that they weren't really ready to put the game down after the final Colossus fell and the credits played. No, no, there, there had to be some sort of final secret hidden in this massive world. You don't just build a world as big as this and not put anything but 16 bosses in it. A, a roving Colossus, a hidden Colossus, tag team Colossus, anything! But the more people searched and searched, the less there was to find. These broken rings in Phalanx's boss arena, the roads all along the wide open plains, whatever was at the top of the temple. There's something here, there has to be! There was at least some merit to the idea of a hidden colossus. A hop, skip, and a jump to the art book shows the eight scrap designs of different colossi, all of which would have been fantastic bosses. Phoenix, who you have to douse in water. Devil, who's like a small boss but wouldn't suck like the other ones. And Monkey, who's very upsetting to look at. Any of these could have been a great final boss! They could be hiding anywhere and we gotta get them! Except... We found the rings and found nothing. We followed the tracks and found nothing. We even reached the top of the temple and there's... There's nothing across the bridge. Nothing. Every nook and cranny. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing! Eventually, the killing blow came in the form of the biggest fan of anything ever, Nomad Colossus, who the developers at Bluepoint asked for pointers when designing the remake since he knew more about the game than anyone else possibly could. He came forward and said, There's no secret. There's no final Colossus. The worst possible scenario had been reached. It hit worse than any of these other games with long-term hoaxes. Shadow of the Colossus had no grand secret. We finished it. 
it's over. I'm using the time left in this section to get on my soapbox. Blue point, why didn't you put the Eight Cut Colossus as DLC for the remake? I know, it really would have ruined the game and make it not a perfect remake and ruin the story, but I don't care! Going from one of gaming's greatest works of art right on to another one, Club Penguin was something I just, I, I never really got into growing up. I was a Wizards 101 kid, all right. Show me where in this game you can cast a spell. Regardless, it was still a massive piece of nostalgia for a lot of people. They'd play for hours doing this and this, and I, I still don't get Club Penguin, honestly. But what I do get is doing a little digging for not a lot of rewards. The bill I racked up from Bigfoot hunting is evidence of that. On the Club Penguin map, there was a hidden unmarked location of the beaten path called the Iceberg. It didn't really serve a function up until people got the hair trigger to think, nah, there's no way this place is completely pointless. As such, people thought that you could flip the iceberg. I mean, come on, this thing's asking for it! So people got to work, but how do you tip an iceberg exactly? Well, why not jackhammers? I mean, the penguin's toolkit was limited, so... Jackhammers? Hundreds of penguins would gather around and drill for that sweet, sweet justification for wasting so much time. Since kids are by their nature, jerks, hoaxes popped up all around the internet about how to tip the iceberg. It wasn't using jackhammers, it wasn't wearing hard hats, it wasn't aliens because sure, there were aliens, I was busy playing Pop Tropic, I don't know what's going on. They'd never say how to do it, they just tell you it was possible, then run off to go pick the legs off a bug like psychos do. The only bigger jerk than kids were game developers, apparently, since they would egg on the players by drip-feeding them hints and teasers, like an in-game newspaper reporting on the phenomenon of players trying to accelerate global warming, and an achievement for getting a big enough raid party to come together and try to tip it, but no luck. Speaking of no luck, 2017 would be the final year Club Penguin would be operating. Turns out just trying to keep a game afloat on goodwill and nostalgia wasn't working and the game had to be shut down. It's the way that all Fusion Fault clones eventually go. However, the team wasn't just going to let the game go silently. They decided to take fiction and turn it into fact. On the final days of Club Penguin, if there was a big enough party together and drilled like never before... Is this heaven? You did it. You finally did it. One of these stupid hoaxes bore fruit and we can finally shut down a few days later. Come on! While you were there, you could grab a free hard hat called the Iceberg Tipper and read a message from the developers to the loyal fans who had stuck by till the very end. However, the most prolific name in video game April Fool's Day pranks, what an honor, is Electronic Gaming Monthly. Established back in 1988, EGM was one of the most important video game magazines in a time where such a format was still new. However, the lasting legacy of EGM is without a doubt their unwavering devotions to making up a new hoax every April. Now, despite the fact that modern day magazines have disadvantages like requiring more manpower to output the digital media, needing an often pricey subscription to access, and only coming out once a month, they had one ace up their sleeve. They only came out once a month. What? Uh, let me explain. What that means for April Fool's jokes is that even if the issue comes out after the first, it's still gonna have the joke story in there as the April Fool's joke. They got into the game in 1991 with their first prank being a code in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 where you could play as Simon Belmont from Castlevania! <laughs> cool joke, dude. However, their most famous prank would come just one year later in the middle of the fighting game revolution kicked into gear by Street Fighter 2. Stemming from the mistranslation, you must defeat my Dragon Punch to stand a chance, to you must defeat Sheng Long to stand a chance, EGM pounced on it like a wounded gazelle to make up a method for unlocking Sheng Long, the mysterious trainer of Ken and Ryu. To do this, you have to, and hold on to your butts, kids, play as Ryu, beat the entire arcade mode without being hit once, and then go 10 rounds with M. Bison without being hit. Be thankful they're merciful enough to not have you light the controller on fire, too. Then, and only then, you'll get a chance to take on Shen Long. Given there were no other sources and there was already confusion over the translation snafu, people jumped on it as fact, despite the fact that literally just below this was a statement saying there was a joke somewhere in the issue. <laughs> Jesus, guys, I don't know where it could be! A full half decade later, an EGM scratched their chins thinking, no, we could do it better, and revisited the gag in 1997 with Street Fighter III saying that Gokin, the character who was revealed to be Ken and Ryu's trainer in Street Fighter Alpha, was just the Japanese name for Shen Long, since Akuma was known as Goki in Japan. 
this rumor got so out of hand that even Capcom's American branch asked the Japanese branch, so why don't you tell us about Shenlong? However, the joke came full circle come Street Fighter 4, where Yoshi Oriono himself told the magazine it's possible that a gag from their past will become fan service in the new game. Uh, he's probably talking about like a title for the online mode, maybe a, a reference in some winning dialogue. Oh crap, there he is! Lo and behold, Gokin was finally added as a playable character, with a lot of influence from the EGM pranks, like double fireballs and assure you can finish her. You may be asking, okay, if EGM is this master comedian, why are we spending so much time on this one prank? That's because the rest aren't nearly as famous or interesting. Oh, a 3D Pong coming to the Atari Jaguar? A gamer's camper knife? A Lego Halo game EGM, please, my sides can only take so much. However, they were also oddly prophetic in making their jokes. In 2002, they said Sonic the Hedgehog was coming to Super Smash Bros. Melee, unlockable after beating 20 opponents in the game's hardest mode. He was later added to Brawl. In 2006, they joked Apple was releasing a device capable of playing iTunes, movies, Call of Duty, and Madden. And then Apple released the iPhone, which played iTunes, movies, Call of Duty, and Madden. Still waiting on that Lord of the Rings kart racer. Despite EGM being a shadow of its former self at this point, there's no denying they had a real impact on gaming culture as a whole. Being behind one of the most famous hoaxes in the history of gaming is something that you can hang your hat on. Oh, I get it. You think you got me all figured out. Think that you think like I think and thought I was gonna make another cooking video. Ah, yeah, well, guess what, Buckaroo? I see you. The joke's coming a mile away. It doesn't work. Never assume you can see what I'll pull next, because when it does happen, you'll never see it coming. You got-